All right, good morning-ish for your West Coasters. Good evening, our European folks. Really good morning to our Asian friends. Uh, and thank you for joining us, if you hear that late. Uh, I'm Dave Slater. I work on the operations team here in Mozilla, and I spend a lot of time thinking about, worrying about, stressing about, and occasionally do something about change. Uh, and so today's topic is really near and dear to my heart because uh, it's what I think about most of the time. And I imagine many of you who have been here more than even a few months feel the amount of change that Mozilla has undergone, even in a rel if you've even been here a relatively short period of time, if you've been here a few years, you've seen an incredible amount of change, right? All the way from Firefox OS and advertising within our browser and our product area to how we operate, our compensation program, how we're structured, the leadership team, an enormous amount of employee growth, real big changes in how our community operates. Uh, and it is tumultuous, and it is exhausting. And I have uh, bad news. It, I don't know that it will ever change. Uh, I believe this is the state of our industry. We're in the, uh, the technology field. The technology field is really a baby. It's in its infancy, uh, and it's tumultuous. And if I look ahead at what's happening the next quarter, two quarters, next year, next two years, Mozilla is going to go through a lot of change. The industry is going to go through a lot of change. The internet is going through a tremendous amount of change. Uh, and so I've given up trying to change the world. It didn't work. It was a great strategy. Uh, missed that deliverable. And now it's a real focus on what can we do it. So if we can't change the environment, uh, how can we as Mozillians, and I think about this of myself, how do we manage it better? How do we communicate better around it? How do we uh, help set up our organization to absorb that kind of change uh, and involve in the world? And so our speaker today, Kirsten, who I always mispronounce as Kristen, Kirsten. but it's Kirsten, <laughs> so I don't get it either way. Uh, is someone who spends a lot of time thinking about executing and in the world of change. Uh, she uh, formerly was the CIO at uh, Salesforce and under, uh, took on a whole bunch of interesting changes there, organizational changes. Uh, currently at PayPal, similarly if you followed PayPal in the news, this is an organization that had dramatically changed from where it was two years ago in many, many ways, corporate structure primarily but other ways as well. Uh, and she spends a lot of time thinking about and managing uh, and understanding this topic. And so I'm very interested and thankful that you're here today uh, to really help us through that. And so she's going to talk about a case study of change. I want you to kind of focus on the abstract nature of it. Right? She's going to talk about something that they did at another company. Don't worry about the exact change that they were actually making. That isn't the relevant bit. It's all the pieces around it. Uh, and see what we can extract from that and learn from that. Uh, and lastly, she's going to go crazy. She's going no slides. Whoa, right? Talk about change, so please. Uh, and welcome to Mozilla. I like to walk around. We'll do a handheld. So how many of you have been to Golden Gate Park, the Japanese tea garden? Have you guys been there? So if you... Walk up to the tea garden. You're walking over this wooden bridge. And that bridge, you look down, and you see there's all these fish in the water below. And the fish are, does anyone know what kind of fish they are? Koi. koi. The koi, also the Japanese carp, same kind of fish. And so I took my daughters there, and we got really interested in these fish. So I looked up, OK, Japanese carp, what are, what are these fish? I found out some interesting things about this fish. The first thing, if you take a Japanese koi fish, or Japanese carp koi fish, and you put it in a 20-gallon fish tank, that fish is going to grow to about six or eight inches. You take that exact same fish, you put that fish in kind of a pond, like you see in Golden Gate Park, that fish is going to grow to about 12 to 18 inches. You take the exact same fish, and you put it in a seemingly unbounded body of water. And that fish is going to grow to about three feet long. 
And so I'm talking about change. Why am I telling you a fish story? It's, well, could be because I'm from Alaska, and we Alaskans always love ourselves a good fish story, but that's not actually it. The reason I'm telling you the story is because I think that it really sets the stage for change and what change is all about. Because really, from my experience and what I found in, in driving and leading change in global organizations, is it's all about the environment that you create. We are all the fish in the pond. And we have the ability to change ourselves. We have the ability to ch change the organizations we're in. But we really have to have the right environment to do it. And honestly, very few companies have the right environment to do it. So what I wanted to talk about today, Dave mentioned, I'm going to tell a case study. And this is a case study about PayPal and a large transformational change that I had the honor and the privilege of leading there. And I'm going to tell this story in three parts. The first is the case for change. Why change? It's hard. Why would you do it? The second part of the story is around how we structured that change. Because I think these are some of the, the ideas that you will find might be relevant or applicable here at Mozilla. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is really the lessons learned or the big ideas from the change that I think have really contributed to um, PayPal being able to be very, very successful in its change. So I want to make sure that we have time for Q&A, both for folks in the room as well as the virtual audience that we have. So um, I will say probably 15, 20 minutes at the end for questions. But if there's anything that's absolutely burning as I'm talking that you just cannot wait, please don't hesitate. I'd love to hear, I'd love for this to be a dialogue and not just a monologue, despite the fact that I'm standing up in front of you with a mic speaking a monologue. So let's start with the case for change. Case for change was about four years ago. I joined um, PayPal. And like any good new leader, I went in and I sat down and I talked to developers, I talked to the product managers, I talked to customers, and tried to understand, like, what's it like to be here? And the one thing that I heard over and over and over again is, it is so hard to get work done. Everybody works so hard. Everybody is so passionate about what they're doing, but nothing is getting done. And when I looked at our product release calendar, what I saw was over the prior 18 months, we had released about three new products. And most of these weren't actually even full new products. They were just features of existing products. And so when you take a step back and you think, OK, who is PayPal and who is PayPal in the Valley? We are known as being this incredible, innovative company that's constantly coming out with new products and ideas with these with legendary um, founders uh, who are now building electric cars and uh, have a, a little payment startup uh, over, over across the way. Um, we had change and innovation in our DNA. And somehow, we had lost our way. Um, definitely, the mojo was gone. And it was really hard to be working in a company where everybody was working really hard, but nothing was actually getting done. So everyone felt like we needed to do something, but there was not even remote agreement around what that something was. So what I found across the organization was a lot of different pilots, experiments of pockets of places where people were doing things. They just took it upon themselves. They said, this is crazy. Can't stand this. I'm going to take it upon myself to, to drive this change. And that was great. The problem was PayPal had become a company that was big. It was global. We had 85 separate technology domains. And in order to release any single product, it took anywhere from 15 to 20 of those domains to be working together. So if one of those domains was doing something differently, they still had to rely on 15 or 20 other groups in order to get a product out the door. And if those other product groups weren't working in this new way, anything they were doing, they, were, they had all the pain of the change, but they didn't have any of the benefit of the change that was, was actually being implemented within the group. So super frustrated organization. 
And from a, a business imperatives perspective, we really truly, from a revenue perspective, needed to be a lot better at releasing new products for our customers. The joke I always tell, it's like, you know, the 90s call, they said we'd like our website back. You know, it was horrible. So that was, our, that was really the case for change and, and the environment that I walked into when I started. And so I had been at Salesforce and had driven a, a change there that was predominantly around how we got our work done, moving from a waterfall development methodology to an agile de development methodology. And at Salesforce, change is really, really easy. It's easy because Mark kind of stands, he's a very large man, any of you who've seen him in person or even on uh, uh, virtual means, he's a huge man. He stands up and he, he declares things and everyone goes, okay, and we do it. My dad used to say life is easy when there are no alternatives. At the time I was at Salesforce, Mark would stand up and declare something and it was really easy to get stuff done because it was clear there was no alternative. We were gonna move from Waterfall to Agile. So we did that in about two months and it was pretty easy. But one of the things I had seen from having that experience was that delivering software in Agile was actually a better way to work. And so I brought that concept into this case for action we had at PayPal and, and started to really talk to different groups and say, you know, do you think this is something that might be able to work? And a lot of people said, yeah, I think that that's a better way to work, but we've got a lot of problems. And so, you know, the second thing we had to look at is how do we structure this change and, and what are we trying to change? We knew that our objective was to be better at delivering product to our customers and products that our customers actually wanted and liked instead of products that um, executives sat in a room who are not our customers, who don't really understand our customers, thought our customers would like. So actual customer-driven um, products. We all agree that that's what we wanted, but... In order to figure out exactly what we should do, we pulled together cross-functional teams of individuals who were truly um, passionate about the company, passionate about our customers, and passionate about our technology, and really understood what our architecture was, what our limitations were, but also, more importantly, what our potential was. And these cross-functional teams came together and realized we needed to do four things if we were going to drive a change and actually make it easier to get work done at PayPal. And the four things broke down like this. The first thing, we needed to have a product-driven company. We'd been project-driven. I don't know if any of you would, would relate to this. Maybe, maybe it's like this here. Maybe it's like this other places you've worked. But you'd get all this funding. A big project would happen. Something would be released. And of course, because time and scope and money and all those things, you had to cut back, cut back, cut back. So you always said it was going to be release one, release two, and release three would be coming. But as soon as release one was out the door, it was like cockroaches when the light comes on. All of the individuals who'd been working on that project just scattered. And we're working, and suddenly we're working on the next big thing. And so that, that product that got released never actually had an owner and never got to release two, never got to release three, and was actually never finished. So we had hundreds and hundreds of abandoned products. So we needed a product, a product organization. We needed to understand what were our products? What is our product hierarchy? Something as basic as can, can you name the six product lines? We ended up with 18. Can you name the 18 product lines at PayPal? And no one could. So we had to spend actually an incredible amount of time, just over seven months to figure out what our product lines were. So having the right structure for our products made it very important because not only did it give us structure, it gave us ownership. And when you are trying to drive change, it is absolutely critical that you have owners of that change. So having a product structure and having product owners who truly felt they had ownership and then having teams that are aligned against those products so they aren't constantly moving and switching context between this project and that project to I am working on a product. I own this customer experience. I care about what quality this product is going to have because if it has poor quality, that's going to be back on me and I'm going to spend more time fixing problems than I am building new software, which is what most developers prefer to do, right? And so having that ownership was really important. The second part 
of the structure was we introduced a concept around customer-driven innovation. Everybody talks about being customer focused, having customer in the center, driving, driving from a place of customer centricity. But very few companies actually put that into action. And so we trained the entire organization on customer driven innovation. It's now called, the, the new buzzword that's way cooler is design thinking, because it sounds way cooler. So we had not only the product managers, but also the um, development teams trained in customer-driven innovation, going out, actually sitting with customers in their homes as they used our product and as they were going through their financial lives to figure out, hey, what, you know, what are the needs? Because oftentimes customers can't articulate what their needs are. You have to be with them in the moment. You know, we found that we had a remittance product in Latin America. And what we found by actually following folks as they were coming to banks to pick up their money was there was a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear when one was going into the bank to pick up their remittance because they didn't want to leave the bank with a large amount of cash because they would be robbed as soon as they left the bank. And what they said was they would really prefer it if they got smaller amounts of cash. But on the other side, whoever was sending them a cash didn't want to send smaller amounts of cash because they had the, the transfer fee every time they were making the transfer. So from their perspective, they wanted to send you one big lump sum because it would cost them less. A very simple change, we didn't need to change the product, we changed our pricing to a monthly pricing model. One price, you could send as many transfers as you wanted over the course of a month. A very small change, but something that drove the volume of our remittance product in Latin America through the roof. And we never would have known that if our development teams hadn't been on the ground with the customers actually living in this product. And so, the customer-driven um, innovation and really truly putting the customer at the center and driving everything we're doing made it a lot easier and it made it a lot more clear of what it was we were going to work on because we were letting the customer drive the agenda rather than executives drive the agenda. The third structure of how we put the change together was just the mechanics around Agile. And we fielded teams, we took our entire global workforce that included all of our engineers, all of our software development, as well as our quality engineers, our architects, our designers, um, our product managers across the globe. So over 4,000 people um, globally. And we field them into teams, and we aligned those teams with the product hierarchy that I had talked about previously. And so it might sound pretty easy, and on paper it is pretty easy, but in actually executing, it was pretty difficult. We had about 370 projects that were in flight. And we made the decision to make the change to Agile in a single day. Most companies, and I, I'm a former consultant, I'm, I proudly wear that badge, and most consultants will tell you, you should never do a big bang anything. It's too risky, it's, uh, it's bound to fail, you don't give yourself the opportunity to recover, but we did the exact opposite. We said, okay, I know everyone says we shouldn't do this. My boss actually looked me in the eye and said, no, no, you're not going to do that. I said, no, no, we are. And I really feel strongly that we need to do this. And he says, I think that this is going to be the biggest failure you have ever seen in your entire life. You just don't understand PayPal. You don't understand the way we work. This isn't going to work. I, you have to trust me here. And I said, no, actually, I think you have to trust me here. I'm willing to put my job on the line for this. And the reason I'm willing to put my job on the line for this is because I, because of the way we work at PayPal and because of this interdependency I talked about previously where we have, you know, 15 teams that all have to work together. I knew that we did not have the organizational stick to the you know, ability to actually stick with something through wave after wave after wave of change. And so for this particular change, I felt so strongly that we needed to do it in a big bang because it was the only way the company was actually going to get through the change curve that I somehow talked him into it, put my job on the line for it, and thank 
God, uh, it actually worked. And I wouldn't have had the courage to do that had we not done it at Salesforce and I'd seen how successful it was. But th the difference in scale is, is huge. So at Salesforce, within the ICU organization, we had 400 um, employees. The overwhelming majority sat in the one market building on the same floor. Um, at Salesforce, we had you know, over 4,000 worldwide. And they did not sit anywhere near one another. So this was a huge risk, but it was one that definitely paid off. So we implemented Agile. It took us seven months to field the teams, figure out what the product lines were, get, get all of the teams aligned, and then figure out what that transition was going to be of these 370-plus projects mapped into this new way of working. But on um, May 3rd, 2013, we flipped the switch, and we became an Agile shop. I think we're the only company of this size that ha made that shift, made it in that way, and have been extremely, and have literally from that day forward, the entire company started working in a new way and had new, ri new rhythms, new ceremonies, and just a completely new way of working. I, have, I must confess, I get absolutely giddy when I walk through our development teams and hear people say things like, you know, we're going to have to have a release planning meeting on that and figure out where that's going to go on the roadmap because the way the teams used to respond was an executive would say, hey, I want you to do this, and then, a, and then they would feel the team and they would scurry off and figure out how to do it. Now there was a process in place where teams really owned those products, they owned those roadmaps, and they owned that customer experience. So really, really successful change. The last portion in terms of how we structured this program was around measurement. One of my uh, peers at PayPal, the CIO, Brad Strzok, he always says, what, get, what gets measured is what gets done. And we definitely have found that to be very, very true at PayPal. And for this change, we had a very structured measurement program. And at first, we were just measuring, you know, are, is the organization practicing the new behaviors? Are the teams doing things in a different way? We were measuring those things. We weren't measuring outcomes because, you know, you have to practice Practice, practice. It takes people doing something 21 times before it actually becomes a new muscle and it becomes a new habit. So we had many months of practicing that we needed to do. So we spent really the first full year not measuring the outcomes, but measuring the behaviors. So are the new behaviors in the organization? And we wildly rewarded those teams that were, that were actively um, participating in the change and participating in those new behaviors. And all of those measures, and over time, we now are at a place where we're measuring outcomes because the teams have now been working in this way for over two years. And every single sprint, we have two weeks box, you know, um, time box sprints. Every two weeks, the velocity of these teams increase. And kind of as a diversity shout out, we are just starting. We haven't, we haven't fully... Um, gotten all the data, but anecdotally we're seeing that um, teams that have at least one woman on them, doesn't matter what role that woman plays, doesn't matter if she's an engineer, doesn't matter if she's a quality engineer, doesn't matter if she's a product manager, those teams are more productive than the teams that are all male. So just a shout out for diversity and another way that diversity helps uh, increase the productivity and positiveness uh, of, of the world and certainly the world of technology and software development. So. Um, that's how we structured the change. And so the third piece, you know, like, so what are the big ahas? Like, what did we learn? I think that the one thing that really made a huge difference was the Big Bang approach. And I think that it's something that most companies no longer really even think about. Everyone just assumes I, we need to start with a pilot, we then need to, we need to move through in waves. So sort of the learning here and the advice here is, don't look at every change in the same way. Really look at the change and figure out how many people is, th is the change going to be impacting. How, how global is it? How pervasive across the organization? And how interdependent is the change between the teams? And can teams actually, individuals or teams, actually get benefit before the entire organization has this change up and running? Or is a, is a big bang perhaps appropriate? And so that, for me, you know, I've, I've now done it twice. It's super, super scary. But both times the payoff has been very, very high. Um, change is hard. It is really painful. 
and it the big bang accelerates that pain but it also accelerates the benefit and so being in a position where you can start to feel the benefit of the change sooner rather than later is really important the second kind of aha or key learning that we had was the cross-functional teams that we pulled together, some people volunteered, others were voluntold, um, and we pulled these cross-functional teams together. Absolutely critical to have the people who are going to be impacted by the change participating in the change. It seems like such an obvious statement, but I'm now in the middle of an executive rotation. I've, I've moved from technology into a job in HR, and one of the things that I'm just my mind is blown in HR on a daily basis by the fact that there's so much change that HR is driving and never do they even think for an instant to go and actually ask the employees who are going to be impacted by the change to participate in the crafting of the, the change and the programs and, and thinking about how, you know, in their heads they're thinking about how it's going to impact employees. But oftentimes HR people don't think like, regular, no, no offense to anybody who's in HR in the room, I'm in HR, but oftentimes people in HR don't think like the way engineers think. I know, crazy, right? Um, but so, so it isn't so obvious that you have to get the people who are going to be impacted by the change actually part of the change. And for, for us at PayPal, the other you know, key learning was you have to, as leaders, trust these teams. Time and time again, the teams would come back and they would come, of course, to the steering committee and they would present, here's what we're going to do and here's how we're going to do it. And the number of time that our, you know, both our middle managers and our senior managers would, would listen to what the, the teams would recommend and then would say, no, oh, no, no, we can't do it that way. No, I don't want us to do it that way. No, I think we should do it. I think, and it's like, the, we had to completely retrain our middle managers and our senior managers Guess what? The ground truth is the truth. The executive truth is not the truth. And executives live in executive truth. And it's not, I'm an executive. It's not because I'm stupid. Um, it's because by the time messages and, and information gets to me, it has been filtered through so many different people that the story I get is actually not the ground truth. And nobody's doing it to deceive me. Nobody's trying to tell me stories. They're, they're just, it's kind of like the telephone game that you played when you were in kindergarten, right? The story just morphs a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. So by the time it's actually being communicated to somebody at the senior manager levels, it actually isn't the same story. And so, and also, oftentimes, as executives, we're, we're calling on experience that is five or ten years old. And so you're presenting solutions to problems we saw five or 10 years ago, and we've got a context that is completely wrong. And we have to get to a place where we can accept and understand and appreciate that the teams who are putting together solutions actually know better than we do. And we have to trust and empower. And so that was a big learning through the change process. Because I think there's a lot of times where you have differing factions, different people. And, and really, what's different is the context. Most of the time, you can agree on what it is you're trying to do. Because everybody wants to succeed. Everybody wants to do the right thing. I have rarely found an employee who's like, nope, I'd really like to do the wrong thing. I'm here to make sure we do the evil thing. You know, nobody is actually doing that. No one says that. Everybody's trying to do the right thing. It's a matter of making sure that everybody has shared context and they're understanding what is the thing and what is the current information and why is this the right solution for the organization and then getting folks aligned around that. The final thing in terms of lessons learned was incentives. The product organization and the technology organization at PayPal were at war when I got there. Product hated tech because tech was the black box, tech took too long, everything was at least a million dollars, 
Um, they spoke in a language that product didn't understand, and product didn't get it either. They were too slow. They were too stupid. They, you know, there was all of this back and forth. And it's a common phenomenon in a number of different companies where I've worked. So these two organizations were at war, and it wasn't until we were moving through this change and moving through this transformation where everyone's goals were aligned. The product managers had quality goals, and the technology leaders had quality goals. And that was a whole, I mean, again, duh, how obvious is that, right? Everybody who's working on something should be aligned and have the same goals. They should be rewarded for meeting those goals, and they should be encouraged to work together to achieve those goals. But this was a completely different and new idea at PayPal. And I think it's a completely new and different idea at, at a lot of companies because, well, product is way different than technology. We can't have the same goals. We use different systems. You know, there's all the reasons why we shouldn't align our goals when, in fact, there's an overwhelming imperative that you must share your goals if you're actually going to be able to achieve change and drive that change consistently across the organization. So that's the PayPal transformation story. We started with our case for action and how we structured the change in the four different components, starting with the product hierarchy, customer-driven innovation, implementing Agile, and then putting in the, the measures and metrics to make sure we were measuring the change. And then finally, some, some big ideas around you know, why this change was successful and, and perhaps places where there can be some learning here at Mozilla. So I started with our fish story, and I will bring us back to that, and I think really the imperative for, for leaders and individuals within any company is to create that environment where change can actually happen, where change is embraced, and where we recognize that change is, is hard. And as adults, it's even harder. I always, you know, I love my friends who have small children. I have teenagers, and, and so don't get to experience this much anymore. I guess the rolling eyes and all that. But, this, you know, small kids who are just learning how to walk, what happens, right? So the kids... They stand up and they take one step and they fall down on their bum. And everyone around them claps and cheers. Yay, that was fabulous, that's so wonderful. And, and the kid gets back up and tries it over and over and over again, hundreds of times maybe. It takes that child to stand up and actually walk and be able to run. But we as adults seem to think that when we try something new for the first time, we should be fabulous at it the very first time we try it, right? So, you know, First time we're out of the gate doing this, we should be fantastic at it. And if something, and if we're not fantastic at it, in some way we are flawed. And that's not, that's not the case. So part of creating this environment and part of having a company that can embrace change is a company that celebrates the, the fact, the mere fact that you stood up and tried to take a step, even if you immediately fell on your bum. That's when everyone around needs to clap and cheer and say, wow, that was the most fabulous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. We all need to do that for each other rather than being critical of each other because it makes a huge, huge difference as to whether or not you're going to be willing to stand up and take that first step again. So being in a company and being part of a company where you feel responsible for, for creating that environment where change can actually happen and you can be part of making that change successful. So... I would love to open f for any questions. And Diane has this fabulous <laughs> foam orange box that you get to have to ask a question. Any questions? Questions in the room or IRC? Send them on. I see one over there. Oh, God. <laughs> can you? Can you? Oh. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be throwing uh, the box. That was a cop out. Cop out. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what you talked about is how to enact uh, a significant change in an organization, and you hinted at sort of dis discussing and deciding what is the thing. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the company decided what the thing was? What yes. was your strategic process to understand that? Absolutely. This is a this question is so relevant for us and PayPal because we got this whole we got it working. So the company was actually able to produce it, whatever it is, right, the widget, um, more effectively with greater process. But our picker was broken. We, we could do things very quickly, but we were still picking the wrong things to work on. Um, I don't know if any of you ever, we piloted this product that was PayPal Float, and uh, thank God. Um, <laughs> 
and this again was, we still had executives making the choices of what to do. PayPal float in a nutshell was basically, buy it today, we'll float you the money for three days, and then we'll come and get it from you. Well, guess what? Seven out of 10 people never actually gave us the money after we <laughs> floated it to them. So that didn't go over really well. Customers didn't understand it. There, you know, it, fraudsters immediately picked up on it. It was just the worst idea in the world. So we, we had a lot of, our picker was broken on those things. And so it has taken us probably two years to develop a strategic planning process and actually have an articulated vision. What is it that we are trying to achieve? And it took the executive team actually aligning on what our key imperatives were. And once we had that in place, then we had a strategic planning process where we have, on a quarterly basis, an evaluation of um, business cases that align, that have to specifically align to the business imperatives. And we constantly are going through a process of reprioritizing and I, making sure that the these teams that we have, we now have over 500 Agile teams across the globe, are aligned against only the highest priority items. And so that process is, we try to make it very lightweight. Um, we try to make it, you know, only at, at the most six months in advance. We've gone through a period where we try to do it a year in advance. That was too much, particularly when you're working in an Agile environment. We didn't really know enough, out far enough, so we've now you know, moved that back to it's a three to six months. So every three to six months, we're really refreshing to make sure that what we are working on are aligned to the business imperatives that we have. And the, the communication of what those imperatives are and what the projects, products that we are working on that are aligned to those is really important because um, the, the culture at PayPal was, hey, I'm working on something really cool. And so I know this is what we're, we're supposed to be working on, but I'm working on this thing that's really cool, so I'm just going to keep working on this, and no one's going to notice. And we probably had a third of our organization working on this, whatever that was, where no one is going to notice. And finally, we, we had visibility in place we have a single source of truth. We know what, you know, I can right now pull up on my computer and tell you what every single person in the company is working on. And I can go down that list, and if it's something that's got a name that I don't recognize, that's not one of those top imperatives, I actually send an email to that team and say, hey, what you working on? How does that tie to these things? And having the executives actually engaged in sprint reviews and and looking at the reports and having regular cadences around roadmap reviews and the product lines having accountability to be delivering to what their commitments were as part of that strategic planning process. It's been really, really important. Did that answer your question? Throw it, throw it. Is it working? Oh, oh it's working. Okay. All right, here's my question. Uh, so I do our diversity and inclusion programs, and I find that one of my struggles in determining organizational readiness for change is that we're very, very different in our levels of readiness, both in parts of the organization and in individual people. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you manage that at PayPal. Yeah, so we have, you know, we have the same. We've got some organizations that are that are really great at this and some organizations that are not so great at it. Um, one of the things that we use grassroots organizations across the company, and one of the things that I do when driving change, Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point is a book that really changed my life in terms of driving change. And so in that book, he talks about three different kinds of people. There are connectors. Those are the people, we all know them. It's like you say, hey, I'm working on this. They're like, oh, Bob worked on that two years ago. And then Sam and you know Sally and, and connect all of the people who might be related to that. Second group of people is the salespeople. These are you know individuals who can sell ice to Eskimos. They can just sell any idea, any product, any anything. And then there are the mavens who are really deeply knowledgeable in a certain area. Architects are often in this area. 
So at PayPal, as soon as I get into any environment, I'm like, okay, I start, and you start asking around. It's not, it's not like it's in the directory. You're gonna find these names next to people's names, but if I ask you, who at Mozilla, name one, name one maven here. One maybe someone who's got deep expertise that everybody goes to for something. My boss is a maven. All right, so er, Amy, totally, she's the maven in this space. So you just ask people, and they know. It's it's not like it's written down anywhere, but the organization knows. So I pull together a list of who are all the folks that are in those groups. And when I'm trying to drive change, even if that organization isn't necessarily ready, they are going to have these three types of individuals or at least two of these types of individuals within that group that can help bring that organization along. So that's kind of the grassroots way of, of engaging folks that are on the ground. The other is we do have um, a very lean, it's only five people across an organization of seven, 17,500 people at PayPal now. So five people for 17,000 people who do actually help us. And if we've got an organization that's particularly weak, we will take one of these individuals, embed them in that team and have that individual act as really an internal consultant to help them along the way to help them through that change. That's kind of one of two of the ways, both top down and sort of bottoms up that we manage that. Did that answer your question? Okay, I'm gonna ask this in a very abstract way. So if you're going to involve people in creating the change you need, mm -hmm. and you need to utilize the talents of those people, um, corp have a very tight turning radius and they can swim in ponds really well, and sharks swim at high velocity long distances. So how can you take a shark and say, you need to go and do a pond strategy for this? Like, what was that like at PayPal when you had to repurpose talents? Yeah, and so in terms of when you're driving the change, you try not to take the sharks and give them the, the sharp turning radius tasks, right? You try to give the sharks the, you're gonna uh, swim in, in straight. So you try to match talents, like the natural talents of people to what needs to happen. And in any project, there's gonna be all different type, any kind of change. There's gonna be all different types of, of tasks that need to be done. So trying not to get people to have to, in driving change, completely change their nature and their strengths. I'm a big strengths-based leader, so I always try to, okay, whatever your strengths are, let's find the tasks that are gonna map to those strengths. So in terms of fielding your team to those tasks, that's one component of it. But if you're talking about the overall, like we, we need to be operating in a different way. We've been working in waterfall. All of our engineers have been working in waterfall and now we need them to work in agile, which is something just a complete shift to how they do their work. What I will say is, in every change I've driven, about 80% of the people get on board. About 20% of the people are conscientious objectors. They just absolutely, you know, I'm sorry, I've always done it this way. At PayPal, it came in the, in the form of, we, I've been successful doing it this way. I've been very successful doing it this way. And I'm gonna keep doing it this way until you force me to do it a different way. And so oftentimes that group of people, not all 20% make it, so sometimes they just have to leave. At Salesforce, we had about 20% 20, 20 of the population that was invited to industry because they could not make the shift. Um, at PayPal, it was, that number wasn't as high, um, and part of it was because we started with the reward systems that we had, had developed, we started to show, okay, that might have been what made you successful in the past, but if you're gonna be successful in the future, these are the people who are being successful in the new world order. And look at how wonderful they are and look at the rewards they are getting. You either, you know, and cognitively people can generally get on board with that. It's like, aha, so my world has shifted. So now I have to start operating in a new way. So at, at PayPal we probably had about, probably 7% of the population that just kind of opted out because it, this the way of working was not a way that they were particularly comfortable with, and they just, it just wasn't for them. And would you give teams a certain period of time to solve it internally before you suggest an organizational restructure? Yeah, that's a really good point. One of the things I didn't mention that I should have mentioned, because a lot of companies, and PayPal prior to this change is certainly amongst them, a lot of companies believe that in order to drive change, you need to have an organizational structure change. PayPal is, is guilty of, hey, this is broken. Let's have a reorg. How many of you have ever 
seen that a reorg actually fixes a problem. Reorgs never fix problems, ever. They generally create more problems, but most companies try to, at least they'll lead with the, the organization reorg, and then they'll try to create the change, or they'll just say the reorg has made the change. Um, this was the only, also the only change in PayPal history where we made zero organizational changes, none. So there weren't any actual hard line moves to anybody. Everybody still had the same boss. Everybody still had the same peers. Everybody still had the same org structure. What was different was how we were doing our work. And so I think that was really important because the consistency, the disruption when you change the org and when you give somebody a new boss, I don't think, again, the executive truth is it's just a reorg. It's no big deal. If you actually are on the ground and are living through constant reorgs, it is so disruptive. It is so, it, it actually makes the change harder instead of making the change easier because as human beings, we are going through this internal struggle of, I now have a new boss, okay? I get to reprove myself again. I have to learn how my personality is gonna map with this person's personality. I have to figure out, you know, this new boss is gonna have new thoughts about how they're, they're gonna add value in the organization. So everything I've been doing, you know, a lot of that's gonna change, plus the change of what the, what the organization wants us to change. So I really think that where possible, if at all possible, do not introduce an org change either to solve a problem or thinking that the org change is required to drive change within the organization. Because I really do believe that human beings can work across organizational lines very easily if we give them, again, the right environment to do so. And what's the right environment to do so? It's an environment where your goals are shared, making sure that as if you're crossing those organizational boundaries, just make sure people have aligned goals and they're working towards the same outcomes. You don't have to all work for the same boss. You can have the same goals and still achieve things. And, and in fact, the organization will be stronger for people working across silos and working across boundaries in cross-functional teams in that way. Does that answer your question? Okay. I do want to um, acknowledge that we have many people not in the room, and we had a few questions come in. So um, you, one question is, You've referred to Salesforce, Schwab, and PayPal. I believe they're all considerably larger than Mozilla. Mozilla is about 1,000 people. Can you talk about effective change from the vantage point of, of uh, organization smaller, like our size? Yeah, absolutely. So at the time I was at Salesforce, it was significantly smaller, though it was bigger than uh, Mozilla. I started, we were 2,500 people uh, in 2008 when I started uh, at PayPal. So, uh, or excuse me, started at Salesforce. But keep in mind, most of the um, employees at Salesforce are salespeople. So in terms of, in terms of a like for a like, I do think the, the size of, you know, if you just looked at the technology organization, the product organization, and then the um, G&A functions, Probably the time I started at Salesforce is about the same size um, as Mozilla. I also had the opportunity to be um, a founder in uh, a co-founder in a startup that did um, self-service devices for the unbanked, doing financial services, and so that was a company that was about 500 people. So I have had experiences in, in significantly smaller companies where change and growth. One, you know, the change and growth of smaller companies. Generally, um, it, it, it's on two ends of the extreme. You're either growing so fast and, and new things are being added so fast you feel like your hair is on fire, uh, and you're just, you know, you're, everyone is working 24 by 7 and you just can't keep up, or things are just slipping so fast. And, you know, I rode that wave in the startup. We were just growing so fast, so fast, so fast, so fast. And then when things started to go south, they went south really, really, really fast. And so, you know, rode the, the, the ride back down. So I think that the concepts of change do apply regardless of the size of the company. So the kinds, um, the kinds of change you're experiencing are probably gonna be different, but the principles of 
getting the individuals that are going to be impacted by the change part of the change, aligning the goals, really thinking about your implementation strategy, whether that should be phased or whether that should be something that's done in a big bang. It's a lot easier to drive change in a smaller company. I think that's one of the things that, you know, it's easier, if you've got a company of 1,000 people, it's easier for you to get all 1,000 people um, to hear the same messages. For us at PayPal to have 17,500 people hear the same messages is really hard. No matter how we try, our whole life is the telephone game I talked about. And so a company this size actually has a benefit of its size in being in communication and, and articulation of what the change is, what the goals are, what we're trying to achieve, and getting folks aligned around that. It's easier in a smaller company, so there are some benefits. Do one more um, from the chat. Um, it, and you mentioned this. You alluded to diversity and the benefits of diversity earlier. Um, the question is, is what do diversity and inclusion mean to you? Um, and what are some of the things you've seen and experienced that work well, particularly in changing environments? Yeah, so I'm working a lot on this right now in my role in talent. One of the core values we have at PayPal is inclusion. And we don't define inclusion um, just from the gender perspective or just from an ethnicity perspective. It really is diversity in thought, it's socioeconomic diversity, um, it's diversity in capabilities, and, and the value and the power of bringing all different types of individuals into teams, because most everything that we do in, in corporate America today is team-based. It's either formally in a team, informally in a team, but getting different types of thinking in, in the team is really the end game, right? And so that's what it means to me, is making sure that we have as many different um, perspectives, and we're bringing a lot of different individuals that have different contexts to solve problems and doing that in a way where they are empowered to actually execute on the ideas that they have. And so for us, um, I've spent a lot of my life trying to get more women in technology. Um, it is a very lonely, barren, <laughs> hard place being a woman in tech, particularly in uh, Silicon Valley and in the Bay Area. So I personally have a huge passion in, in that particular space. And so because I have a passion there and I've spent so much time there, I will give some examples of the things that I think are really important in terms of increasing the number of women. But this is not the only way I define diversity. It's not the only type of inclusion that's important. But particularly within from a tech context, one of the things is, is certainly um, there are a number of programs that exist today that didn't exist 10 years ago that are focused on getting women and, or girls um, particularly as they move from um, grammar school into middle school and high school to stay interested in math and science. And so I think those programs are really, really important because we have seen gradu graduates from computer science programs go down. When I graduated, we had 35% of computer science classes were women and we're down to about 18%. So it's really important to, to get the more women into the pipeline. So I think that's one thing that's really important. From a, um, you know, from a hiring and a talent acquisition perspective, the one thing that's going to change your diversity, particularly women in tech, fastest is to hire senior technical women. I came into Salesforce. There were eight white men that worked for me. I left Salesforce. There were four women and four men on my leadership team across all um, different ethnic groups as well. And, and, and those teams, as a result, I left Schwab. There were 50, the um, CIO had been a woman. Um, chief she was promoted to chief administrative officer, Don Lepore. 50% of the um, technology team at Schwab were women. 100% of those women went on to become CIOs at companies in Silicon Valley. And so, and each of us have done our part to make sure that we are attracting and retaining um, top female talent. At Schwab today, there are zero women on uh, the leadership team in technology. And it's, I mean, it's really, really sad. 
and the leaders at Schwab now are all male. And it, this is not to bash on Schwab. I love Schwab. It, it was a, just one of the best working experiences. But it's just to say how important it is to have senior level technical women because we do do a lot in terms of attracting and retaining uh, the, the female talent within the space. I could talk for like another four days on this topic alone, so I will stop. Very good to know. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for maybe one more question in the room, if there's one. Everyone knows how to make big change. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're all going to yeah. run back to their desk and ah, start changing there's things. There's a question. <laughs> She's risk averse. Uh, you talked about something like 20 groups, 4,000 people making a change right on the same day. Can you talk a little bit? How do you socialize, get buy-in, mm -hmm. right? I mean, is it purely a top-down, do it or else? Yeah. Uh, or maybe there was a whole lot that happened before then to yeah. try to make that successful. So it took, first of all, it took us seven months. We, it, didn't, it wasn't like, hey, let's do this on one day, and then tomorrow was the day we did it. So it took us seven months to get the organization ready. We did have top-down support, but what I would say is our top-down support was, was, hey, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, they wanted us to do it, they thought it was a good idea, but nobody, I think I knew, but any, anybody else on the executive team didn't really understand what it meant, and they were a little bit afraid of it. Um, so what it really came down to was us having this this amazing network of people across the organization that we called transformation champions. And so those champions were talking to their teams, were talking to their managers, were talking to their peers and making sure that people knew what was coming. They had the key messages. We did training of, you know, a, a one-day training for everyone on core agile and principles, so how to work in this new way. We had a two-day class for product owners, how to be a product owner and a product manager in this new world order. And then we also had a class for scrum masters. Then the other thing that was really important that I think we did, we had rather, you know, training is crazy. It's kind of like saying, hey, you're going to learn how to swim. You're going to sit in a classroom for eight hours, and then we're going to take you to the pool, and we're going to push you in. Good luck. Um, you're probably not going to know how to swim. So we had 20 coaches, so change experts. They were experts on change. They were experts in what it was that we were trying, the change we were trying to affect. So in this case, agile and, and customer-driven innovation. And we embedded them across the globe. And so those experts were on the ground working with the teams. So once we changed, they had a coach. They had someone to help them with the change. People were not alone in making that um, change happen. So I think the, the coaches were a really, really important part of that. So yes, some tops down. PayPal is not a tops down place. It's very much the, you got to get everybody on board. It's very consensus. It's very, um, people have to believe in what you're doing, or they're going to fight, really fight against it. And again, they're not fighting against it because they're bad people. They're fighting against it because they just have a different idea about the, about the how to get to the destination. Rarely do we have people disagreeing about what the destination is, but often we have people disagreeing about how we get there. So you have to, there's a lot of talking. I will, I always say to people, you have to hear something seven times. Like you guys are gonna have to sit through this speech on change seven times before you're even gonna remember anything I said. So you have to hear something over and over and over again before it actually sticks. So that, you know, we just said the same thing over over, over across seven months. It was like people were so sick of me because I just said the same thing over and over again. But actually, when the time that, that, that you know, we flipped the switch and everybody was working differently, it was like, oh, I actually remember why we're doing this. I actually am believing in this. I'm actually on board and we're doing it. Um, that said, our middle management layer was the hardest layer to, to get on board. And they were the ones who were like, I was successful, especially our dev managers, because it's like, wait, I've been successful by being the hero and swooping in when everything is going south on these projects and being able to pull in you know, Jerry and Sarah and, and Billy to save the day. And this new way of working, I can't do that anymore, so how am I going to be successful? So the middle managers was the group that we had the, the biggest um, shift with. And we recognized that and put, put in very specific targeted training for that group to help them understand how they would be successful in the, in the new 
um, way of working. Okay, great. You've been a fantastic audience. Thank you so very much.